Listo. Hola a eh, todos. Eh, muchas gracias. Primero por la oportunidad. Eh, eh, voy a hablar en español para introducir y después paso al inglés para la charla con el profesor eh, Ferrari. Mi nombre es Carlos Santa Cruz, soy médico internista, intensivista, eh, certificado en ultrasonografía y ecocardiografía de cuidado crítico. Y en conjunto, este es un esfuerzo conjunto del de comité de ultrasonido. Quisiera agradecer a, a, al doctor eh, Andrés Ruiz, a, al doctor Néstor eh, Caicedo y al doctor Juan José por el esfuerzo que estamos haciendo en conjunto para traer este webinar eh, muy interesante con el profesor eh, 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 Ferrari. Voy a, a pasar al, al, al inglés ahora eh, para presentar al, al profesor Ferrari. So, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Ferrari, for uh, your acceptance to participate in this uh, webinar, very interesting webinar. Uh, uh, of course, Uh, uh, Professor Ferrari needs no introduction. He's uh, a very renowned uh, doctor uh, with many papers on the use of ultrasound for a uh, diaphragm evaluation of critically ill patients. Uh, Dr. Ferrari uh, is a postgraduate in respiratory disease and works at the Pneumological High Dependency Unit at the Umberto Ospedale Mauriziano in Torino. Uh, I, I hope I said that right, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much for your for your for your kind acceptance to participate, and 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 the webinar is yours. Thank you very much for your kind invitation, and I wish to apologize for my awful English. I'm sorry. Okay. So I was asked to talk about uh, diaphragm ultrasound and uh, uh, just a brief introduction to uh, why use uh, ultrasound to assess diaphragm. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, we have a look at, to how to measure the diaphragm with ultrasound, and uh, if we we have time, we see also how to how diaphragm ultrasound can be employed in the critically ill patient and uh, to see if uh, ultrasound can be employed as a measure of a respiratory effort in the critically ill patient. Uh, we know that the diaphragm is the principal respiratory muscle and uh, um, sonographic evaluation has only recently gained popularity because we have uh, other test to um, to uh, assess uh, the the diaphragm such as fluoroscopy pulmonary function testing the ct scan uh, magnetic resonance maximum respiratory pressure and the transdiaphragmatic pressure there is the gold standard but each of these methods uh, is uh, as, um, maybe difficult. Uh, CT scan exposed the patient to uh, radiation. It is a static measure. Uh, magnetic resonance is rarely employed and is very expensive. And uh, the gold standard requires uh, insertion of a nasogastric tube and um, It is not a, a routine analysis. So why not uh, using ultrasound? And uh, because ultrasound does not expose the patient to ionizing radiation, it is a, a bedside procedure. It is non-invasive. Uh, it offers a real-time evaluation of the diaphragm uh, movement and the thickness. It is fast, easy, and uh, uh, reproducible. And uh, the more the patient is ill, the easier is the visualization of the diaphragm. If we have pleural fusion, uh, atelectasis, pneumonia, we can uh, have an easier identification of the diaphragm. And uh, it is the method of choice in the investigation of hemidiaphragm paralysis. 
With ultrasound, we can assess a change in muscular thickness during inspiration, or uh, we um, can assess excursion during active breathing. So we know that it has many advantages because it is non-invasive, we saw, can be performed in a few minutes. Uh, it has some disadvantages because uh, an ultrasound equipment uh, may be not available in all facilities and um, uh, operators must be trained in the technique to visualize and measure the diaphragm. Another uh, disadvantage of uh, diaphragm ultrasound is that uh, left hemidiaphragm uh, is uh, quite difficult to visualize. And so um, if we don't suspect uh, diaphragm dysfunction, we evaluate often only the right hemidiaphragm. And uh, there are also some problems because uh, uh, methodology, ultrasound methodology may be variable since uh, study to study affecting uh, uh, comparison of uh, the studies uh, with each other. So we can uh, evaluate the diaphragm looking at the motion or looking at the thickness and the thickening of the muscle. To evaluate uh, uh, the motion, the distortion of the muscle, we, can, we must use a convex probe or at least a phased array probe. And if we want to uh, evaluate the thickness, we must use a linear transducer. Let's have a look to the excursion. I have to uh, put the probe uh, in, uh, under the costal margin in the midclavicular line uh, in the, between uh, the midclavicular line and the anterior axillary line, and I have to direct the probe medially, uh, dorsally, and cephalic in order to uh, put the ultrasound beam uh, toward the dome of the hemidiaphragm. At first, uh, I use B mode, and then we set the ultrasound uh, machine in M mode to display the motion uh, of the anatomical structure along the selected line using as an anatomical landmark the inferior vena cava and the gallbladder. When the patient inspires, the diaphragm uh, goes towards the probe, and if I set the end mode, I have a waveform with the concavity downwards, and I can measure the amplitude of this waveform. It is the excursion of the diaphragm. And I can also measure the inspiratory and the expiratory time on the monitor. This is uh, how I can put the probe on the human body. I see an hyperechoic uh, line. This is the liver in this case. And when I set the ultrasound machine in a mode, I can see a wave with the concavity downwards. I can assess uh, the exertion um, during quiet breathing, during a deep breathing, or during, during a voluntary sniff. This technique, the voluntary sniff, is uh, useful in assessing, di in assessing diaphragm uh, paralysis. Because if the diaphragm is paralyzed, like in the lower part of the slide, during quiet breathing, I may have no movement of the muscle as opposed to a normal muscle. And if I have a diaphragm paralysis, when I ask the patient to perform a voluntary sniff, I may have a paradoxical movement, as you can see in this part of the slide, where there is a, a, an inward concavity because the negative pressure during the voluntary sniffing attracts the muscle cranially. And so I have a paradoxical movement as opposed to the voluntary sniff in a normal subject. This is what I see. I, first, uh, I put uh, the ultrasound uh, in B mode, when I have a good acoustic window, I see the hyperechoic line that is diaphragm. I can set the M mode, and I, I can observe the scorsion of the, the diaphragm. Buonasera, come ti posso aiutare? Uh, so I can measure the amplitude, the time, the inspiratory time and the expiratory time, and uh, if I want, also the speed of contraction of the mask. 
these are uh, values in uh, normal subjects. I remember that right MED diaphragm is easy to uh, assess, while only in 20% of the patient we can uh, visualize the left MED diaphragm due, due to scant acoustic windows uh, of the spleen. Um, maybe sometimes it can be difficult to obtain a subcostal view even in the right side because of post-surgery tubes, uh, air, and in some patients we can visualize the diaphragm in a, a lateral approach. When I use the lateral approach, I put the probe between the anterior and the axillary line and the mid axillary line, but we should use an anatomical mod because if I use a mod, I can overestimate the excursion of the muscle. So if I put the probe in the lateral approach, I must uh, have uh, the software on my ultrasound machine for an anatomical M mod. We can measure the excursion, we can measure the thickness. To measure the thickness, I must use a good uh, linear probe with a frequency between 7 and 12 megahertz. And I put the probe in the zone of opposition. It is between the 8th and 10th, 11th intercostal space, uh, between the anterior and the mid axillary line. Uh, the probe must be perpendicular to the skin until I am uh, going to visualize a three layer structure that is uh, the central layer is the diaphragm muscle, the diaphragmatic pleura, and the peritoneum. I can measure, of course, uh, the thickness of the muscle. I have to put the caliper as close as possible to the diaphragmatic pleura and to the peritoneum without including them in the measure. There is no consensus which is measure in B mode or in M mode at the moment. We can measure, uh, there is no difference. You can measure as you prefer. In B mode, you save a clip and make the measure of line or uh, freezing the image in, in a mode, and you can uh, measure the amplitude of the thickness during expiration and during inspiration. Remembering not to include pleural and peritoneal line in your measure. If the patient cooperates, you should uh, instruct the patient to take slow deep breathing in and out, and we have to capture images at the point of minimal and maximal diaphragm area. Um, excursion. In normal subject, there is a wide range of thickness uh, measure, but the most important thing, uh, measure is not thickness itself, but the thickening fraction, as we are going to see. We have to calculate the diaphragm thickness fraction that is uh, represented in this formula. It is uh, end inspiratory thickness minus end expiratory thickness divided end expiratory thickness expressed as a percentage. And uh, it, this measure can uh, uh, reflect uh, the function of the contribution of the muscle to the, uh, it can measure an, in, in this, an indirect measure of the expiratory effort, like the ejection fraction of the heart. So in this case, you can see the expiratory thickness, the inspiratory thickness, and uh, we calculate that the fraction is uh, 95%. At uh, resting uh, inspiration, uh, in normal subject, uh, the thickening fraction is uh, about 20%, and uh, in one third of healthy subjects, uh, um, as a matter of fact, there is a very minimal diaphragm thickening during the tidal breaking. So we can observe also values uh, about 20% of thickness. A brief uh, summary of what we said until now. If uh, I want to measure the excursion, the ideal range is uh, a probe with a 2 and a 5 megahertz. I have to put uh, a mode the, um, and I have to set the maximum depth on the machine to uh, capture maximum excursion of the diaphragm. 
And if I measure thickness, uh, remember to use uh, a linear probe with a um, frequency between 7 and 12 megahertz. In this case, there is no consensus in preferring B-mod versus B-mod for the analysis of the thickness of the muscle. And now that we know how to measure the muscle, let's see uh, if there are clinical applications. We can use diaphragm ultrasound, for example, to assess diaphragm paralysis. We can use that from ultrasound to look at the uh, patient ventilator asynchrony. We can use uh, diaphragm ultrasound in assessing diaphragm in the critical ill, and we can use ultrasound during weaning. Paralysis, we have uh, previously seen that uh, um, it is uh, very easy to assess paralysis because if a diaphragm is paralyzed, we have no movement of the diaphragm during inspiration. And if I ask the patient to perform a sniff test, uh, I can see a abnormal paradox movement of the diaphragm. When I have to assess diaphragm paralysis, I have to measure excursion, but I must not forget to measure also the inspiratory thickening, because if I don't find an inspiratory thickening of the diaphragm, I can corroborate the suspect or hemidiaphragm paralysis. When I have an hemidiaphragm paralyzed, uh, it is uh, interesting to see that the healthy hemidiaphragm will have uh, um, amplified extrusion and uh, an amplified uh, thickness and thickening fraction because of the compensatory movement uh, as opposed to the paralyzed diaphragm. Here is what you can see during the normal respiration during this sniff test in a normal diaphragm and what you can see in a paralyzed diaphragm in which you have no movement during the quiet breathing and the paradoxical movement during a sniff test. And here again, a normal diaphragm in which you have a normal amplitude and a paralyzed diaphragm in which I observe no movement during a uh, inspiratory efforts of the patient. And also without measuring, you can see that uh, one muscle, uh, muscle is contracting and the other is paralyzed. Let's go on. We can use the front ultrasound to assess patient ventilator synchrony. Uh, when we ventilate the patient, we have to put together two brains, the brain of the patient and the brain of the ventilator, and they must work together to be synchronous. Sometimes there is a synchrony. The ventilator is never wrong because it is like a computer. Computers are never wrong. The patient, for definition, is always right. The patient is always right. And if there is something abnormal, maybe that uh, there is uh, probably something in the brain of the doctor that has set uh, parameters on the ventilator. So let's have a look. Can we use the ultrasound to have uh, some indication on a patient ventilator asynchrony. Well, the gold standard to understand the forms of asynchrony are uh, uh, recordings of pressure, flow, esophageal uh, pressure. But we, if we are able to put to, to plot together on the same screen the swing of the esophageal pressure and the swing of the diaphragm movement, we can have some interesting information. For example, in uh, the left part of the slide, you can see diaphragm displacement, and with the little arrow, you can see a lower diaphragm excursion that corresponds to a lower swing of the esophageal pressure. It means that indirectly, ultrasound can give us an assessment of the inspiratory effort of the patient. Or in this case, we can observe diaphragm excursion and we can measure the inspiratory time. And the inspiratory time, the neural inspiratory time of the patient in this case, is 1.28 seconds. If we look at the uh, wave of the um, pressure of the ventilator, we look that uh, inspiratory time is only 0.8 seconds because the ventilator 
allows the patient to exhale while the patient still needs to inspirate. He's still an inspiratory effort that causes a double trigger, as you can see in this uh, ventilatory axis. And this can suggest us to change ventilatory parameters. And uh, this is one of the uh, situations in which uh, diaphragm ultrasound can help to assess uh, the synchrony between patient and ventilator. We can also look uh, at diaphragm excursion. We have uh, a higher and a lower uh, excursion. And if we look at the waveform of the pre airway pressure, we look that only the higher displacement of the ventilator uh, of the diaphragm uh, trigger the ventilator. The other lower displacement of the muscle are not able to trigger the ventilator. This is an ineffective effort in a patient uh, ventilated in pressure support with uh, 16 centimeters of water, for example. And if I optimize uh, the ventilatory setting, each displacement of the ventilator is followed by an act, uh, each displacement of the muscle is uh, followed by an act of the ventilator. So we can use uh, ultrasound to check uh, uh, patient ventilator asynchrony. Well, in effective efforts uh, we have uh, already seen, we can use ultrasound to assess uh, trigger delay, for example, if we are able, of course, to plot the two waveforms together. This is the, the first dotted line is the start of a neural inspiration, and we can look how if there is uh, an important trigger delay because be between the diaphragm excursion and uh, the trigger of the ventilator. We already seen the double trigger because we can measure the inspiratory time of the patient and the inspiratory time of the ventilator, and we can modify the ventilatory setting to avoid double trigger. And we can assess also the reverse trigger. The reverse trigger may be very similar to the double trigger, but as a matter of fact, uh, it is uh, much different. And uh, if we have um, the wave of diaphragm excursion, we can look um, as uh, after a passive diaphragm displacement, there is an active diaphragm contraction, that is the respiratory trigger. Either double trigger and uh, reverse trigger can increase transpulmonary pressure and, and worsen ventilator induced lung injury. So we must uh, be aware of this phenomenon and try to avoid uh, in our me mechanically ventilated patients. And I can uh, use diaphragm ultrasound also to assess if there is an uh, auto trigger. There is no contraction, there is an act of the ventilator. So this act is auto triggered by the ventilator and is not induced by the patient. So I can uh, use ultrasound to monitor the diaphragm function in the critical ill because uh, we should uh, have in mind, uh, keep in mind that uh, any patient uh, requiring mechanical ventilation should be considered to be at risk for the development of this function of the diaphragm. The problem is that not all physicians are uh, consider uh, the diaphragm and the diaphragm dysfunction. Um, there are easy, recognizable uh, conditions like uh, endocrine or electrolyte disorders, but the majority of um, causes of diaphragm dysfunction in ICU patient may be induced by mechanical ventilation itself or by sepsis. Um, in this interesting paper, a control patient that underwent surgery and were ventilated for a short period of time, just a few hours, were matched with a brain-dead organ patient ventilated for more than 24 hours. And what was observed that after 24 hours, uh, there was an histological change in slow and heavy uh, chain of musing. So mechanical ventilation itself, when uh, it is, uh, uh, it can induce an histological change, an anatomical change in the muscle. And we know uh, that uh, in control of mechanical ventilation, for each day of ventilation, we can observe a reduction of the thickness of the diaphragm. And it's not only mechanical ventilation, but also sepsis itself that can induce a dysfunction, either in experimental uh, animals and in humans, 
you can observe how the rela- force re- frequency relationship is significantly affected in septic mice and in humans uh, with infection, uh, transdiaphragmatic pressure is affected by uh, septic state. So many situations can induce a dysfunction of the diaphragm. Mechanical ventilation itself may induce uh, um, dysfunction. We know when we use pressure support, we um, have an ideal U-shape. We should try to um, treat the patient and set uh, an ideal pressure support level that it is a a safe compromise between uh, an excessive assistance and uh, an insufficient assistant uh, such to um, uh, preserving spontaneous breathing with uh, an acceptable level of muscle unloading. How can I assess uh, uh, the contribution of the patient to the inspiratory effort? Well, I cannot assess with the physical examination. Uh, I cannot assess uh, looking at waveforms. Uh, the method to assess uh, the inspiratory effort uh, is to place uh, esophageal and gastric tube and to perform uh, mechanical uh, uh, measures of respiratory mechanics, uh, work breathing and pressure time product of esophagus and uh, the diaphragm. But these measures are uh, difficult to obtain in clinical practice, require offline calculation. And uh, um, we need to be aware of the damage that we can uh, cause with uh, ventilation to our patient because we can induce a, a, a damage either to the lung, but also to the diaphragm. We can induce a damage if we over the patient because an excessive unloading can cause diaphragm weakness. And of note, it is important to remember that uh, um, the effort uh, that the patient uh, makes to trigger the ventilator cannot avoid the development of acute disease atrophy. But there is also the opposite situation. If I have uh, an excessive respiratory load and uh, I can induce uh, muscle inflammation, my fibrillar damage that are um, worsened by a septic state. And also the regulation of PEEP may damage the diaphragm. If I use an excessive PEEP, I can uh, have a disadvantage on the length tension relationship, uh, impairing the performance of the muscle. And also low PEEP, that other than uh, causing atelito trauma and pain luft effect, may cause uh, damage to the diaphragm because of the so-called eccentric loading. This is the same slide in which uh, uh, we are uh, we have to uh, be aware of uh, the damage that we can induce in a uh, ventilated patient. So there is, a, um, we can ask, um, the diaphragm ultrasound is, uh, can be a measure of the inspiratory effort. If we look at some data of the literature, you can see that, uh, for example, increasing, uh, decreasing the pressure support level, we have an increase of the thickening ratio. The, the lowest is the level of ventilator assistant, the higher is the contraction of the muscle. And we, if we analyze uh, and we correlate the esophageal pressure time product per breath with diaphragm thickening ratio in patients without diaphragm dysfunction, we have a good correlation. So diaphragm thickening ratio can be a, a sufficient uh, measure to estimate the work of breathing. And also in this uh, other paper, uh, it was observed that, that increasing uh, pressure support level, there was a decrease in the pressure time product of the diaphragm, and there was a decrease in thickening fraction of the diaphragm, and these two variables correlated quite good. So in a particular situation, thickening fraction can be a surrogate of the inspiratory effort. It cannot be applied widely. There is much more to study about this correlation, but in some circumstances, uh, the thickening fraction of the diaphragm can give us a, a surrogate of the inspiratory effort. 
same data or, or their studies. And I wish to conclude with the use of diaphragm ultrasound in weaning. We can have another uh, application of the ultrasound during weaning. And we know that uh, many causes uh, are different weakness is caused by many events, such like mechanical mutilation, sepsis, drugs, malnutrition. And when uh, the patient it is ready to be weaned, we can try to assess the efficiency of the muscle, looking at uh, the displacement or the thickness of the muscle. And uh, two studies have uh, shown that uh, uh, if we measure the diaphragm uh, thickening fraction, we can uh, have uh, a cutoff to differentiate patient uh, that uh, fail uh, with patient who uh, succeeded the spontaneous breathing trial. If we have um, a diaphragm thickening fraction superior to 30%, we can think that we can win off the patient from the ventilator. And there are some meta-analyses, uh, um, and all these studies uh, show that uh, the thickening fraction may be a good predictor of winning. The assessment of uh, excursion has a lower accuracy, and uh, moreover, uh, I can use diaphragm excursion only in a spontaneous liberating patient in absence of ventilatory support. So if I want to use diaphragm ultrasound as uh, an indicator for uh, winning, as a winning index, it is preferable to use the diaphragm thickening fraction at the, at the moment. So to conclude this uh, talk, uh, ultrasonography diaphragm may be a promising tool to evaluate the function of the muscle. We can look at the excursion and thickness and uh, it can uh, be useful in assessing diaphragm weakness, paralysis, uh, and dysfunction. Um, in the critical ill, uh, diaphragm function is very important. We perform uh, echocardiographic uh, assessment, lung ultrasound, uh, venous ultrasound, visual ultrasound to, for invasive uh, procedures. Uh, um, Few of us assess uh, the diaphragm in the critical patient, but we should try to change our behavior because uh, we must be aware that uh, diaphragm dysfunction may be pre-existing the admittance in the hospital, may be caused by uh, the ventilation, by the safety state. And uh, if we monitor diaphragm, we can uh, recognize and treat uh, early, uh, and we can avoid the heterogenic uh, trauma to the muscle. In some cases, uh, the diaphragm uh, ultrasound can uh, uh, be used to assess uh, the function and uh, can uh, help us to monitor the effort of the patient, so that to have a protective ventilation. It is uh, quite easy, it's non-invasive, bedside method, that we can uh, uh, perform it daily without, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and we can have uh, interesting and important data for uh, the treatment of our patients. And uh, if we want to use uh, uh, diaphragm ultrasound as a surrogate uh, of uh, inspiratory effort, uh, well, this method is easier to obtain uh, as the gold standard uh, measure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Ferrari, for this very interesting talk, and um, really shows that uh, you're a true expert on on diaphragm, and I think we're very pleased with the uh, with the talk. I I would just want to uh, open the discussion uh, by asking. I we already saw that uh, the probes that you need to use, uh, the settings on the uh, ultrasound machine. Uh, the right side seems to be the way to go. Uh, many people ask, ask, ask me if, uh, if I use the right or the left. 
But I think you made it very clear that the left side is some, somehow cumbersome and maybe a, a, maybe difficult to see because of the spleen. So the right side should be the way to go. And uh, what about the thresholds? You, you talk about thirty percent in 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 the thickening fraction. But what about the excursion? The, but what 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 is your your measure, and in what type of cases do you do you do you use it? Okay, um, for the side first, uh, the right side is the uh, to, is to prefer during uh, excursion. When I measure the thickness of the muscle, it is uh, easier to see also on the left side. Uh, if I want to rule out a dysfunction of the muscle, I evaluate uh, right and left side. Uh, but this is only for the thickness. And for uh, uh, the cutoff values, well, uh, this is uh, difficult um, because if we consider excursion, and if we consider uh, the cutoff for winded patient from the ventilator, I may have uh, uh, one one point five centimeters. That is the cutoff to establish if a patient can be wind off from the ventilation. But I must perform. Uh, the measurement in the patient in spontaneous breathing, because if the patient is ventilated, the amplitude of the scorsion of the muscle is uh, uh, the sum of two vectors that have the same direction and the same burst, that is uh, the effort of the patient and the pressure administered by the ventilator. So in a uh, mechanical ventilated patient, I cannot uh, use the excursion. I must measure only in spontaneous breathing the patient and the cutoff may be one, 1.5 centimeters of excursion. Uh, for uh, the diaphragm uh, thickening fraction, uh, the cutoff is 30-35%. Uh, it depends on the studies, but uh, at the moment uh, that may be the cutoff value. That correlates uh, quite good with the uh, uh, rapid shallow breathing index that is uh, the, the standard for some patient to be wind off from the ventilator. Great. Uh, I have some some question here uh, for different parts of Latin America. Uh, from from Brazil, my my good friend Marcos asked in 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 cases of asthma or or um, COPD, there is there any correlation uh, with the uh, long, uh, with the diaphragm ultrasound and spirometric values. Uh, do you think that uh, it could be used to evaluate patients with asthma or or or, or COPD? Well, asthma, in case of acute asthma, no, I don't. Uh, it is if we have a severe acute asthma, I think there is no time to perform a diaphragm ultrasound. And um, for COPD, maybe that you, you may have some uh, index that may correlate with. Uh, um, for one uh, different index, that is an index that is uh, my diaphragm index of, of obstruction. But um, in the acute phase, uh, I think that is more important to see the contraction, the thickness of the muscle. That is more important than the scorsion itself, because um, the thickness, if I have uh, an ex exacerbation of COPD, uh, can tell me if the patient is uh, making high inspiratory effort and uh, the measurement of the thickness and thickening fraction can also help me to set uh, an adequate pressure support level if I decide to ventilate the patient. Uh, that, that is, uh, th there is a very good uh, uh, answer and and it leads me to several of the questions that I have here from from Colombia as well. Uh, uh, another good friend Andreas asked, if you're following the patient, let's say you're the patient is it uh, gets to the ICU or to the ER, and and you're following the patient the the ultrasound with ultrasound, do you use the exact same spot to? To measure the, di the 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 muscle thickening, or 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 can you can you is it? I mean, do you have to use the same one, or is it a whole? Uh, or, or 
or can you use, use different intercostal spaces or or can you vary in the in the in the in the measure point no, i should use always the same uh, space you can mark with a thermographic pencil uh, for example uh, the site in which you uh, measure the, di the diaphragm uh, the problem of the thickness is uh, you must have a very good uh, probe uh, and uh, you must keep it very perpendicular and uh, you must visualize very well the muscle and uh, the measure should be made at the same uh, site uh, for each measurement. Uh, you we, know that about... we... Uh, we know that what we measure is correct because there are autoptic studies and uh, um, in which uh, um, la, um, the ultrasound measure correlated uh, excent, uh, with, excently with uh, the autoptic measures. So if we measure the diaphragm in the zone of a position, we know that we are performing a good measure, but we should use, uh, uh, if possible, always the same site of, uh, uh, with the ultrasound. You talked about uh, pressure support, ventilation, and, and titration of the pressure support. However, there is not much uh, literature on this. I mean, we've, we've been searching high and low for studies using a, a, a diaphragm ultrasound to titrate the pressure support level. I, I wish you, I can have your comment on this and why there is no, 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 not a lot of literature on this subject. And and do you think that this could be an interesting idea for a for a study? This is a, a very interesting idea for, for a study. Um, I have some my own data, but uh, I don't talk of unpublished data, but. Uh, I think that there are no data because at the moment we have, we have not uh, we don't think that the uh, ultrasound the diaphragm may help us to uh, set an adequate pressure support level. We just started to uh, uh, apply diaphragm ultrasound in the critical patient. We just need time to uh, uh, to apply every day. I think this is the question. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have uh, studied how to measure the diaphragm, and now we must uh, learn to measure the diaphragm, and we must uh, um, learn to um, translate this data to set uh, adequately the ventilator. How would you go about this study, Professor? I mean, would it be in the acute settings before uh, intubation? or in the patient who is already intubated and you're trying to set a, 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 a spontaneous mode? How would you go about uh, about this study? Maybe that you can measure in, a, for example, in non-invasive ventilation to obtain an adequate pressure support level. This so let's, let's just give you a, an example here. Let's say the, uh, the patient comes in respiratory failure or uh, and then you and then you use the the, the non-invasive mechanical ventilation so, and then you measure and then let's say you start a usually i start with six of pressure support and and if i choose a peep to maintain a, a saturation of 88 92 um, uh, around there yes yeah this is an idea but to perform a study we, we should um first uh, uh, cor um, uh, have a, a good demonstration that um, uh, diaphragm ultrasound and thickening fraction is uh, a fair or good index of the respiratory effort so i should make invasive measure i should uh, um, match uh, the data of the diaphragm ultrasound with the pressure time product, uh, so I can uh, um, have a good data to analyze. The, the, the idea is good. Is, uh, I mean that uh, if you use diaphragm ultrasound, you can uh, increase the pressure support to uh, decrease to a normal uh, level 
or um, thickening fraction may be that if you have a, a thickening fraction above 40 percent you can increase the pressure support under 30 percent to avoid uh, under assistance of the ventilator but you should also avoid over assistance so keep the thickening fraction above 20 percent but this is these are uh, just ideas there are no uh, good data to corroborate what I said now. Further studies, maybe will uh, uh, demonstrate what we are thinking now. Indeed. So, so uh, again, uh, so you, you titrate the pressure support, uh, evaluating the thickening fraction, and then you avoid over. Over, I mean, oversetting the the pressure support or undersetting by keeping the diaphragm thickening fraction in, in let's say twenty to thirty percent. Is that is that that will be a a, a a good reasoning? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Maybe. Yeah, you you talk like a real professor. Maybe yes. Uh, yes. So because this could be integrated into a clinical practice, which is, leads me to uh, the the a question here from 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 Brazil. Uh, in, in order to integrate uh, this knowledge into clinical practice, it, it would mean that you could use thickening fraction or or diaphragmic excursion into almost every day of your clinical practice because you have you're dealing every day in the intensive care unit. You're dealing every day with ventilated patients, so titration of pressure support, weaning from mechanical ventilation, decisions to intubate patient based on a diaphragm ultrasound. So it's a very wide uh, a spectrum of 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 possibilities that that ultrasound diaphragm that diaphragm ultrasound offers. Yes, I use uh, often for weaning from ventilation. My first interest was uh, in patients from weaning from ventilation, and uh, I offer, often uh, evaluate the diaphragm in the outpatient in, uh, to rule out diaphragm dysfunction as a cause of dyspnea. It's very easy in the outpatient. Uh, there are many applications. We perform lung ultrasound very easily, but uh, a few of us uh, think to die from ultrasound, uh, but uh, um, just uh, it takes only a few minutes to be performed, and you can rule out uh, uh, diaphragm paralysis as a cause of dyspnea, for example. Yeah. Like in post surgical cardiac surgery patients. Yes, in cardiac surgery. In, uh, in the past years, I often uh, saw post surgical cardiac surgery patients, uh, and you assess uh, uh, diaphragm. And uh, often uh, the dysfunction of, of the diaphragm is uh, uh, reversible after a few days. Yeah. A final question, Professor. I have here from also from from Colombia. Uh, if if in in weaning you talked about weaning, and how do you compare, uh, let's say, predictive indices such as the Goldberg? In this, uh, in with respect to to the diaphragm ultrasound, is it almost the same? Is it superior? What is your thoughts on this? Uh, uh, I cannot tell that diaphragm ultrasound is superior. We uh, there are many indexes for weaning. Uh, the fact that there are many indexes means that uh, no one of these indexes is a good index, except for uh, the Tobin index, the rapid shallow breathing index. Uh, it, it it is not good for all uh, population, but um, the, the fact is that um, I perform always uh, diaphragm ultrasound. But if the uh, we should also perform the ultrasound is not topic this this uh, afternoon, but of the intercostal muscle because if the uh, I should assess all respiratory muscle the diaphragm. The intercostal muscle that can help me in uh, a strategy of winning. Uh, uh, um, I always calculate, of course, uh, the Tobin index because this, that is the gold standard. But uh, um, 
if the if I have no diaphragm dysfunction, uh, the diaphragm ultrasound, I suppose maybe uh, performing index to help us in deciding when the patient can be weaned off the ventilator. Well, very, very interesting uh, talk and uh, excellent uh, webinar, Professor Ferrari. Thank you, thank you so much for your expertise, and and hope to see you, uh, hope to see you soon in in another webinar on a congress. Uh, thank you for your kind invitation. It was a pleasure. Bye bye, bye bye, Professor. Bye bye, thank you. Good evening. Yeah.